All right. Hello, Jen. We are back again for another session. In this one, we are going to talk specifically about job search process in Canada. From my personal point of view, I think the process is not any different from the US, but I want to hear from somebody who is actually doing the recruitment process and as well as you are helping candidates in Canada to get the job. Welcome back, Jen. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be back. All right. So the first session we spoke about phone interview tips and tips for just the interview aspect of the candidate's job search. But here, let's talk about the phase that comes before that. How do you even get to that interview phase? How do you do networking? So let me ask you this, Jen. Is the job search process different in Canada compared to what's in the US? Sure. I think there's probably a lot of parallels. So what I'll be better at describing is what's happening in the Canadian process. Maybe you can tell me how it might be a little bit different, but I'm very comfortable in how things work here. So I can start there. Sure. Sure. So I actually have a client right now that uh, is from India and, you know, we're no longer working together because he did end up finding a job. So he was a previous client and he reached out to me actually from India. And so I had the, you know, the pleasure of working on the full experience with him. And so what the first step you know, what you have to do is really make sure that your resume and your LinkedIn profile and your cover letter really meet Canadian standards or American standards for that matter. And so, you know, how his resume looked like and, you know, for his target market in India, it was different for what I expected. So there was information on there that didn't need to be there and there was information that was missing. So that's the first step because that's sort of your, your ticket in, right? So you really want to make sure those three documents are on point and that's where you may want to ask a coach or a recruiter for their opinion. So that's the first thing. Once all of that is good to go, uh, you know, of course it's always better and, you know, maybe almost a hundred percent easier and better if the person's already physically in the country. Um, if, if not, then you might want to do things on your profile that say things like relocating to Toronto, um, or relocating to Canada, whatever it is, or willing to, you know, open for relocation, willing to pay for relocation costs, anything, any sort of messaging that might help reduce fears on the other person's part. But it is good to indicate that because there's no hiding the fact of where you live. So if where you live is different from where you're applying to, you definitely want to acknowledge that because you can't hide that. So that's okay. the first thing. You know, again, and, and mimicking what you wrote on when you write on your resume, relocating to Toronto, also on your LinkedIn profile. I mentioned LinkedIn a lot because I utilize LinkedIn a lot. I utilize, um, I get my clients to utilize LinkedIn a lot to, you know, if they're applying for a job, to follow up directly with the hiring manager or HR person directly on LinkedIn. And before you message anyone, you want to make sure you have that optimized profile, right? So. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the first step to make sure all your documents are, you know, meeting the standards. And after that, you know, doing some sort of networking. Networking can be done through LinkedIn as well. So, you know, I have another client right now. He is from Colombia and he speaks Spanish. And the reason why I bring that up is because, you know, I got him to, you know, do some networking as well. And it really worked. What he did is he looked for people who lived in the same city he was targeting that went to his university because now they have something in common. So that is a great tip for you guys, for your clients as well to use is to look for someone exact same thing, same school and the same city that you're targeting and sending them messages on LinkedIn, especially if they went to the same school and they're in the same sort of area, because maybe you'll find 30 people, you know, you're not going to reach out to all 30 people per se, but who are the people that are in a company that you're targeting or in a department that you're trying that's similar to yours or the same. So that's one way to network. People do like to help people that feel similar and familiar to themselves. And the other thing would be, you know, looking at certain groups. I don't know if you guys have something called meetup.com. I think you do. Yep. And so we have meetup.com as well. And, you know, you're looking for local groups. So, you know, I just Googled the other day to show my client that there were groups that were called newcomers, newcomers, you know, from wherever, or I don't even think it was specific of where they're from, but there might be even more specific groups that are specific to where you're from. But the point is they're newcomers to the city. And so connecting with people like that, you know, each person that I sp spoke to that's a newcomer here knew at least one person. So don't stop there. Ask that one person you know 
who else do they know that they could reach out to on your behalf to connect you? You know, and one thing you really want to make sure is that you're not asking these people for a job. So I get really, I hate to say turned off, but sometimes it is a turn off when people reach out to me and they, li they literally just saying, do you have any jobs for me? And, you know, that's not the way to go around it because it just feels like you're, um, I don't know, it just doesn't feel good. So it's better to just come at it more of a, informational perspective that you're looking for information that you're looking to see if they know anyone else or they can direct you in a better way and in that natural conversation if that person can help you I'm sure they would be more than glad to help you and so I think that's where networking um, feels intimidating to people because they feel like well I'm asking you for a job well you shouldn't be asking for a job number one and number two if your approach is casual and conversational then it shouldn't feel that intimidating. And um, you don't, don't worry about those who don't respond to you. I just keep, keep a list going. So, you know, just like I tell people to track jobs, I also tell people to, to make a list, a compile a list of people they can reach out to and that list will keep growing because I'll meet you and I'll ask you if you know anyone else that you can connect me with. And keep adding that to your list. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of babbling on and on right now. So do you have any questions from that? Sure. Um... I have a couple of questions. One, I think I'm pretty sure the client worked from India, right, about the resume. I have seen the resumes. They would have the date of birth, the passport number, and- Marital civil... status. Yeah, marital status, yeah. Those are the things I do not know why uh, they use in India. The IT companies do not need that, but for some reason, if you find resumes from India, it's going to be listed there. I do not know why or how. And pictures, pictures as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing happens here in the U.S. as well, Jen. Somebody who are in their grad school first semester, they're starting to apply for the jobs. They have the resume which they made it in India for the campus recruitment setting in India. And it's typically, it looks like curriculum with it, not of projects or anything. It's like two pages barely filled in there. And the same thing does not work well in the U.S. I'm pretty sure you probably seen the same thing happen uh, with your client uh, from India. Let me ask you this. That person you mentioned about went to the same school, they had some. So can you be more specific on that? Did you mean probably they went to school in India for, and you're trying to find somebody who no. went to the same, same school in India here uh, in Canada uh, and then to network with? So in, in the example that I provided, it was actually um, my client from Colombia. So the point was, is that he, he Googled, um, not Googled, he searched for people on LinkedIn that went to his university and also around a similar time frame. So it was like they were the similar age. And he reached out to those people and let them know that, you know, he was new here and he was wondering if he, that person knew anyone else that they can connect with. And the thing is, that person was willing to talk to him himself because he could relate just like how you're creating this business right now, Regu, you could relate to these people. He could relate to them and he was more than glad to jump on a call. So the point is, you know, finding some similarities. Maybe another similarity is that this person lives in the same city as you, but worked at the same company for you. So for example, ICICI is a very big company, um, a very big bank, and, I, and they have a headquarter here and I actually worked for, for the headquarter here as well previously but the point is, is that it's so big that there are so many people that you can find that have worked at ICICI for example that moved here so if you work for a large corporation that's another example of you know searching on that you know so typing in Toronto and ICICI for example and see who comes out wow so basically find a common link that they can use to initiate the first conversation hey we have this common I'm new here uh, do you think I can spend some time with you uh, to connect with you and learn more about you, right? Correct. Right. So let me ask you this. Let's say I'm a shy person. i would never done any networking in my life. Uh, and I'm coming to Canada. I'm new to Canada. What are the things that I would have to do uh, to, to get a job uh, when I'm, I'm an introvert, I'm a shy? Uh, any suggestions right. and tips? And I think that's why using LinkedIn a lot is really helpful for my introverted clients or even my clients who are introverted still are comfortable with networking because it sounds scarier because they're picturing themselves going to this big 
event and going up to strangers and talking to themselves. You don't have to do it that way, but you do need to be prepared to do that. And that's why I always want people to master their elevator pitch, which is basically like the tell me about yourself. Because if you are caught somewhere randomly, you know, you want to be able to explain who you are. So if you, that tell me about yourself, we talked about in a previous session, which was, you know, talking about your past and then your present and then your future. And again, just to reiterate that, you know, you're at a networking event, you're telling someone, hey, I went to this university, I have this many years experience in this area and I've been focused on these types of jobs. That's your past. And then now I'm looking for, you know, and then your present is that now I've moved here to Toronto and, and looking for a job opportunity in this area, you know, so that's, that's really vague and it's meant to be vague because you can fill it out as you need to. But the template that I like to follow for elevator pitch or tell me about yourself questions is past, present, future. Having that prepared. Mm -hmm. The point is that I'm trying to make is that you're not, you, you start off small. You start off with your messages on LinkedIn, for example, and um, you start off with phone conversations. So this takes the pressure off and you, you also want to make sure you're very prepared. And because you're very prepared, it reduces the nerves. Okay. Meetups.com, right? I'm going in there, there's newcomer and pretty much everybody is a newcomer there. It's a newcomer meetup. How do you approach that situation? What should be the goal of somebody who is new to Canada? They're going to a networking event. What should be the typical approach? So your, your perspective should be, I'm looking to meet new people. Your perspective should not be, I need to get a job. We know your end goal is to get a job. So that's the end goal. But your purpose from these um, networking events is to meet someone that would connect you to um, opportunities or connect you to different people that can connect to different opportunities, things like that. So you don't want to be so attached to, I need a job. This is why I'm talking to you because that will turn people off and make them feel like, well, I can't give you a job. So I can't even help you at all. Uh, something else I want to throw in, in case I miss it later is volunteer opportunities. That's very overlooked. And, and it's, you know, it, there's so much potential in that. And so if you were to, you know, look at maybe offering your services for a very discounted rate or for even for free to different uh, companies, I think that would really be a good opportunity to offer experience. And so, for example, there's somebody that, uh, you know, wanted to get into accounting, but there is a company called H&R Block. And so they have seasonal pop-up shops where they help out with taxes and they do have volunteer positions as well. So this person started off volunteering in these pop-up shops and then eventually got a job with H&R Block helping out with tax taxes and then sort of grew from there. And so volunteer opportunities are overlooked and can help with networking and open up doors. Good tip about wanting opportunities because I do not think that thing happens here in the US. Pretty much somebody who is in IT, they do not think about, let's say I want to do volunteer uh, to go and find a job, but it's possible. That is, that is definitely a possibility. The other thing about volunteering though is that you can do volunteers volunteering that relates to your passion because for one, you need to keep busy and you need to keep your mind you know, sane and also that's networking opportunities because you can meet people in a way where you're just doing service to others without the intention, but then you, you still have the opportunity to network. So you don't always have to network or volunteer rather in areas of where you're trying to target because in some areas that's not like there's too much sensitive information, for example, so you won't always be able to do that. So that's sure. a good point. Um, you mentioned something uh, very important here, or at least from my point of view, when I was in school, uh, Jen, my LinkedIn was pretty much my roommates and whoever I knew in the college. Most of them are students from India. The, I went to grad school in computer science. Out of uh, 80, 90% of the class was Indian students. And we had few Chinese students and rarely we saw uh, any, anybody else, an American student in the class for grad school. I did not have an opportunity to even interact with anybody who was outside from India. So my network was essentially filled with students from India. They are also looking for a job just like I'm looking for. They did not have a lot of value to offer to me in terms of them trying to connect me. 
but that is why i realized i needed to have diverse set of people to connect with who will have more opportunities because uh, that is the key right do volunteer in things that something that you're passionate about that may open up another opportunity instead of uh, uh, trying to find same kind of personality and same kind of a profile uh, it's good to have as a first degree connection it may open up in the future but you need diverse people to connect with that's a very good point so how i help my clients build up their linkedin profile connections is by you know every job that they apply to that they really feel like they have a good opportunity at, or they really can see that they would do well in this job is to figure out by searching the company name and the recruiter or the hiring manager do some searching and sending them messages on linkedin so it's sort of the apply and follow up method and so you're sending a warm message. You're not just sending a connection request with blank. You're send, letting them know, hey, Regu, I noticed, hi, Regu, I noticed you posted this job and I'm really interested in it. I have five years of relevant experience and wondering if we can set up a time to chat. And even if they don't respond to you, you've sent them a message with a purpose. So it's not a blank request. And if they don't message you, that's fine. Now you're, I'm now I'm friends with you and now all of your network, I'm second degree connections to. And slowly I'm building my network this way. So that's a really important thing that you mentioned because you do want to build your network with local people or the city that you're targeting. Okay. In, based on your experience, Jen, and your client's experience, for a newcomer, how long does it typically take them to find a job? Uh, I'm talking about mostly STEM based. Um, so if they're coming new to Canada, they do not have a job. They said, I am moving in there blind. Um, what is the process? Uh, what is the time frame they are looking at? Sure. So let's keep in mind some very slow periods. July and August are very slow periods as well as December. So my client moved here in June. And so he had a very slow summer and it felt really daunting, but he also had a lot of momentum. People were calling him back, just not as quickly. So he knew it was working, but it wasn't as much as he would like. So it took him four months. Um, I had another client that took six months and another client that took two months. And so it really varies. I think I've seen it on average from two to six months, but I will say that with my clients who've done six months, for example, you know, they still were able to get a part-time job very easily. You know, it wasn't a job that they were comfortable putting on their resume, but as far as income is concerned, you know, I just don't want to scare people off. Oh my God, it's going to take me six months. Well, you can still look for a part-time job simultaneously. And maybe that's the method you want to do. Maybe because you feel like I'm running out of money. This is so important to me that I can thrive here financially and, and, you know, so maybe I find a part-time job first, which is easier. And then now that I have a part-time job on my days off, now I'm really exerting all my energy into a full-time job. Okay. All right. Now I wanted to ask specifically about your experience. You are recruiting candidates and from recruiter's point of view, how do you uh, find the candidates? How do you convince them to apply? Are you look? Let's start from there. I got several questions, so let's start from from your point of view. How are you finding the candidates? So, I find all my candidates through LinkedIn. So I don't actually post jobs ever. Every job that I'm given to fill, I'm using. I'm leveraging my network of existing clients that I have, candidates rather, and I'm finding people on LinkedIn. And because I'm finding people on LinkedIn, that's why I'm very much into optimizing your profile because if you didn't have those keywords on there if you didn't have your language on there let's say i'm looking for someone with a certain language skill if you didn't have all that on there i would never have been able to find you and so that's really important that because there's a lot of recruiters out there so you want to make sure you do things like update your skills you know maybe i'm looking for a very specific skill um you know whatever it is python who knows whatever it is i'm looking for that skill so make sure you have those very technical skills listed on your profile and do you search in a specific way looking for clients or you are looking only within your network? Uh, how do you? Clients or candidates? You, candidates, right? Oh, yeah, candidates, yeah. Yeah. So I am searching in a very specific way. It's called Boolean sourcing and it's using operators. And I, I think that they're a little bit technical. Um, so the point is, is that I'm looking for keywords. So if I'm looking for a financial accountant, I'm looking for words like CPA and i'm looking for maybe if, it, if i need them to specialize in tax i might say cpa and tax and i might 
um, also search on job title. Okay. So I'm glad that we're talking about this because what my client from in, my my client from India, the job titles that he used weren't that similar to the job titles we were using, and so I asked him for his permission if he was comfortable of modifying the titles, and with the purpose of you know not not lying about the content of the job or anything like that, and then with with the intention of letting them know you know this is what I called it externally. But, you know, we called it something different, but it's equivalent to this job if that conversation came up. But the point is, is that if I'm searching for a recruiter, if your title is something different, then you're not going to get pulled up, for example. Wow. Okay. You mentioned Boolean search. What is that? Is it basically you're going to put and and then search or it's something different when you have recruiter uh, profile in LinkedIn? Boolean sourcing is a way of, of search of using search strings. So there's operators called and, or, and not, and quotation marks and brackets. And this is a lot of information, but if you Google Boolean operators, um, it'll give you more information on it. And so you can use this yourself. So if you're searching for a job in Indeed, so this, this was very helpful for my candidate from Colombia. He spoke Spanish and I said, hey, maybe there's some jobs that require Spanish and therefore you have an advantage because you speak that language. So we typed in program manager, but because program manager was two words, we put quotations around it. So that way Indeed would only pull up those titles that said program manager next adjacent to each other. We put program manager and, and then and was capitalized. So that way the, the website knew it was an operator and a search function and Spanish. Okay, so program manager and in capitals Spanish, and that pulled up jobs that were very relevant to him. If he had just typed in program manager, it would have pulled up all these jobs that had program and manager in it, which were so many. But by putting the quotations around it, you're really, um, you know, narrowing your search and making it more specific and filtered. Wow, I did not know about the Boolean search, and this applies to how you would search on LinkedIn as well? Correct, it does. Okay. Awesome, all right. So you start with the process, you are sourcing candidate, then what happens after that? Let's say you, LinkedIn is going to give you 100, 200 or multiple pages, and what right. do you do up from that? Well, the good thing is that it usually won't give me uh, too many people because I'll make my search very specific at first. So I'll also um, create my dream list, my unicorn of exactly what I'm looking for. And then I'll expand outwards after that. But then again, I'm reiterating the fact that you need to put all the details on there, almost a copy and paste of what you're comfortable from your resume to your LinkedIn. So after I find some top talent, top talent meaning people who match my query, I will send them a message. And the message is very casual. I don't feel like I need to convince you to, to have this job. You're either interested in having the conversation or not. Now, I'm not telling you, you know, this is, Job is, this job is perfect for you and I'm not set, making it sound too good to be true. I'm just saying, hey, Raghu, based on your background, I'm thinking you might be interested in, this, in learning more about this job or perhaps you know someone in your network that could be interested in learning more. And then that's, that's enough that's not too pushy that you're like, okay, Jen, I, I'd like to talk, but just so you know, I'm not really actively looking for a job. And I tell you about the job and you either are curious to learn more or you absolutely love it or you're absolutely not interested. I'm not really here to convince, convince, convince someone for the job. It has to feel natural. And it's the same way as a job seeker, you shouldn't try to convince someone that you are perfect for the job in a way that comes off desperate. Because you know, energy is everything and it's just gotta be a natural fit on both sides. All right, and if the person accepts, then you begin the phone conversation, initially, just an exploratory call? Correct. All right. When does uh, the hiring manager and the company come to the picture? Well, if that person is, is now interested um, in the role and they've sent me the resume, that I would then present them to the hiring manager and let them know that this person's interested and here's why and giving them some highlights of information, salary, et cetera. And then if that client sees that this person is a fit, then an interview would be set up. So okay. I'm just to be clear to some of our listeners, I work for search firms, I don't actually work directly for a company. So it's presenting it to the client who's hired us to look for someone. All right. 
Canada is such a vast country. You are based in Toronto. Uh, here in the US, in, especially international students, people who are listening to this, they move around a lot. They have two suitcases, they're going to fill it in, jump on a car, jump on a flight, they are in a different city. It takes time. If I want to move to a different city, it's going to be really tough. I have established my roots here. How does things work? Because the IT hub is mostly Toronto. We have some in Waterloo, uh, Montreal, and then Vancouver. Um, so how do, do people usually move around uh, from major cities for the jobs? People definitely do move around. It's not at the same level as Americans I've noticed. And so I find we tend to sit still a little bit more and have more roots. And, um, you know, I am speaking to a, a candidate right now. I'm interested in her for an accounting position. She's from a different province and she now lives in Toronto. When she gave me her phone number, it didn't scare me. I could tell she wasn't from Toronto, I wasn't scared because I saw on her location, she already wrote relocated to Toronto. She made a point to, to note that, of course, I would see this area code and think she doesn't live here. She made a point to mention I live here already. And it was also captured on her LinkedIn. So because of that, it didn't matter to me that she was from a different part of Canada. I still appreciate the experience exactly the same. Awesome. And what's the process? How long does it typically take once the interview process starts? Um, sometimes here in the US, it takes three weeks, uh, sometimes uh, six weeks. Um, so is there a standard format, in-person interview, a phone interview, then in-person interview, or it can be all done Skype and then job offer is given directly? A lot of the times it's in person still, unless there's a reason why it can't be done in person, availability, something like that. Uh, so usually it's done in person and ideally I'd like to say it takes six weeks, but you know, oftentimes it's, it takes shorter or longer, but more so longer just because of different variant variables vacation availability, uh, you know, busyness on, on the employer's part, things like that. So ideally it would take six weeks. Okay. Uh, why is June, July downtime? Here, here, here typically December is downtime. Uh, but other than that, that is hiring throughout the year. Uh, November, it's yeah. so, so, but I, I'm surprised to see June, July is a downtime in Canada. June, July and August is very slow because a lot of people are on vacation whether it's because uh, you know their children are on, or have summer holidays, so they need to be off with them. But the, the, if the recruitment is just very slow, as slow as December is. And wow. it, it's so, mainly because of a lot of people are on vacations and usually because their children are out of school. Okay, here it slows down in uh, December and then picks up in February. They, all the budget gets approved, but never slows down in June or July. That is interesting. So people have to be mindful of that about the time frame. Right. All right. So one last question. Offer negotiation. What are the components that typically goes in the negotiation of the offer, uh, especially in Canadian employers? Sure. So you definitely want to do your research, uh, you know, through, again, websites like payscale.com or glassdoor.com and figure out what your magic number is and then have a range with between seven to $10,000 that you're flexible with. And you want to go in and, and be really prepared with all of this. You know, you also want to keep in mind that your range might be a little bit lower because you're new to, to Canada or the U S and you don't have the relevant experience. So unfortunately, you know, there is a price to pay for that, but you know, it's worth it is the point, right? So maybe it's going to be $10,000 less, but that's also an advantage. It also means that, you might increase your odds for some jobs because maybe that company has unreasonable expectations. They want to pay little for, you know, a very, a rule that requires a lot of technical experience, but that's where, you know, you're an advantage because you're, you might be willing to do that. And you do want to have reasonable expectations because, you know, if the market is a hundred thousand dollars, but you don't have any Canadian or American experience, you know, you might even have to go as low as, you know, I hate to put a number to it, but maybe between 16, 80 and just go under market to, to, you know, get the experience. And the beautiful thing about that is that, you know, when you move around externally, say you stay at that job for a year and a half to two years, then you move externally and now you're starting to catch up and start breaking that gap. Wow. So you that really want to be prepared for all of that and keep that in mind for salary negotiations. Okay. Awesome. Anything else other than the salary that can be negotiated like vacation days because healthcare is taken care of, uh, uh, that is not an issue here. That is a component somebody can negotiate uh, like vacation days or bonus, signing bonus, are those yeah. 
Signing bonus. bonus might be difficult if you don't have the relevant experience. Signing bonus is usually good for people who are leaving one company and foregoing some shares or payouts or things like that. I would say negotiating on vacation might be a good trade off for the fact that you're not getting the salary that you would have liked. Okay. All right. Awesome. So that's all I got to know about the job search in Canada. Pretty much it resembles in what happens in the US. The only thing that stands out is June and July is a slow period. Um, but other than that, networking, it all sounds and looks the same as somebody who will go through. And another thing, important thing I learned is for the newcomer, the time frame it takes and volunteer opportunities and other things to just get it down. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jen. So again, where can people reach out to you? So they can reach me through my website, www.careerrealtalk.com. And my contact information is there. And I would also love if people sent me an invite on LinkedIn. So again, it's Jen Narayan. And then if you search my name and you search for Career Real Talk, three words, they can find me that way and send me a connection request and send me a message that way. All right. So listeners, uh, if you like this, you can just probably send a hi uh, to Jen, connect with her, uh, and uh, just tell her, hey, listen to you here. She would definitely appreciate uh, that coming from you and value that you got out of here. Thanks a lot, Jen. Amazing. Thank you so much, Raghu.